Hello, Deb. Welcome to the uh, Neighborhoods question answer session. Thank you. Feel free to ask any questions you might have. Uh, you're actually the first person here, so uh, <laughs> we're expecting a few more. <laughs> well, it's early. It is, yes. <laughs> well, since um, I can be the first to ask, so the other day at Hope Fest, I got a, I, I can never say the name, Chinqua pin? Chinqua Chinqua pin. Yes. It's about six feet tall, mm -hmm. so yay or nay on staking it, staking it very loosely. Should I stake it? So that's, it's really up to personal preference. Um, we say that you don't need to stake your trees unless they're really floppy. Now, sometimes trees come from the nursery where they're already kind of etoliated, so longer than they can really support. And if that's the case, then yeah, you probably should stake it. But you wanna do a loose staking, like you mentioned, Right. where you have some sort of like loose thing attached to one pole so it can still swing in the wind. So. Definitely, yeah, because I did that to a, a Monterey oak you gave me a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, that died in the frost. So hopefully yeah. you'll have more. Will you, do you think you'll have more Monterey oaks this season? Monterey oaks are really tough to find right now. You Maybe we can get them from San Antonio if I get them shipped in, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unlikely. What about the yeah. HEB Oak Hill event? Yeah, we pro we likely won't have them there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Monterey oaks are a really good tree too. They they're supposed to do really good for the future climate of Austin. So we really do want to prioritize giving yeah. those out. But uh, most of the ner wholesale nurseries around Austin that we get our trees from, they want to hold on to those until they're 15 gallons, so they make a bit more money off of them. Okay. Well, maybe next season then you'll have some. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I hope so. Okay, I'm gonna linger and see what other, other people have to ask. Of course. Okay, thank cool. you. Cool. Yeah, bummer your tree froze in the frost or the yeah, winter freeze. You, I, you gave it to me in 2019, it was doing great. Oh. And it just, I mean, it's, it's definitely dead. I had an arborist come by for another thing and he's like, oh yeah, mm. that's gone. So, mm. so yeah. We lost a few Monterey Oaks this year. Um, and it, that freeze, there's a few around that seem to have fared better than many of them. And I really hope that for the future, we kind of focus seed collection on those and generating oak trees from those that survived because yeah. I'm a little worried about their cold tolerance. Are you Colin? I am Colin, yes. I have some seeds for you on my porch. Oh, perfect, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so come by any time. And you know what, if you can't come this week, we'll connect and maybe I can drive them to your office. I okay, know you're busy. Yeah. I know you're busy, so yeah. Uh, I think I have it on my schedule sometime to pick up seeds, maybe. I might have forgot to put it. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Like I said, if you forget or if you're too too slammed, I can drive by your office. They're they're okay. um, Mexican buckeye, nice big fat. Yeah, seed. that's great. Yeah. Uh, we have a few Mexican buckeye seeds, but we're always looking for more diversity yeah. and more uh, trees yeah. sourced for more places. Cool. All right, thanks. Oh, and Deb, about the chinkapin oak, actually. Uh, that name is really hard to say because it's actually an Algonquin word for nut. Oh, so wow. it's a reference to the fact that chinkapins have a really good edible flesh to the acorns. Oh, the squirrels. Uh, what's the Algonquin? Uh, it's a Native American tribe. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I lost a um, Arizona ash that was probably 60 feet and it shaded my house. And so I have no shade. So I'm going to put that oak there, the chinquan. I'm gonna call it chinkapin, the chinkapin oak. <laughs> so in, in 20 years, hopefully I'll have shade again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oaks are slow growing, but that's really good because that means they're very strong and they have really good structural support. Yeah. Uh, we do have faster growing trees. <laughs> they just, you don't want that near your house. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Austin Energy came by and, and cut down all the hackberries on, on the fence line, so. They're gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we say a fast growing tree is a fast lived tree. Well, it's funny, actually, the fastest growing shade tree that we have here in Central Texas is going to be the escarpment black cherry. Uh, they actually can shoot up like 12 feet in a year, which is really crazy. Um, but they, while the stems above ground are actually relatively short lived, uh, the actual plant itself can live for hundreds of years. 
they just drop their trunks occasionally. Casually. You know, <laughs> like a Texas tree. Well, welcome, Margo. Margo is another Tree Folk staff member, so. Oh, wow. Margo, you are welcome to ask any tree questions that I know you probably have. I do, I do. Is it my turn? It is. <laughs> okay, I'm not driving, by the way. I'm a passenger. Um, what <laughs> should I do if my soil is super yuck that I'm dealing with? Like, what's the best thing I can do when I'm about to plant a new Tree Folk's tree to help that soil get worthy <laughs> of a new tree <laughs> that's a really good question and yuck is a great way to describe austin soils um most of our soils really compacted alkaline clay so trees just aren't happy in it um there's not really going to be a lot that you can do to fix it though the best thing that you can do is to make sure that you're digging the hole for the tree a lot wider than that tree's pot that's going to break up that soil and really uh destroy the compaction and allow the roots to kind of root out from the root ball. Um, a lot of people want to amend the soil, like the planting hole. That's not a good idea. If you do that, what happens is the water, when it rains, fills up the planting hole and before it starts to seep out into the surrounding soil. And that planting hole can actually stay flooded for a long time like that, and that'll kill your tree. So that's not good. If you want to amend your soil, the best thing to do is to top dress. So after you've kind of like, after you've reburied your tree and it's fully planted, but before you've put down mulch, then you want to put a thin layer of compost underneath your mulch, or maybe like a little bit of peat moss to increase acidity. But it wants, you want it on top of your soil. So a little bit of that is going to fall down to the cracks immediately, which is good. And then the rest, when it rains, is going to release acid. They're called humic acids. They come from the breakdown of plants. And that's really important in our alkaline soil because alkaline soils mean that nutrients are not available to your trees. So the acids from the organic things that break down and trickle down, that makes nutrients become available. Oh, you're muted, Margo. Oh, now Matt's on a phone call too. So, <laughs> but that sounds awesome. Here we are being ding-dongs in the car. Um, <laughs> that's good. I need to do that because, uh, you know, we're on this East Austin soil that used to be like a dump. So not only are we fighting really thin soil, again, I don't know, making these words up, but also like pieces of glass and all sorts of elements that, I don't know, some of it might be good, like strange metals that are breaking down. Or maybe not. Actually, like pieces of glass in your soil, that's a large body chunk and that increases drainage. So that's good, especially in a clay soil that allows for percolation along the surface of the glass. So it's. Uh, okay. Glass <laughs> <laughs> is half full. Glass is half full, yeah. Bad soil, but chunky glass. Got it, got it. <laughs> Matt, you have any tree planting questions? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna think of another one because you know I have a ton of them. Um, okay, I'm gonna mute myself though while I'm thinking. Well, the fun thing is I can just vamp about trees for like the whole time. So um, the cool thing about planting trees, let's see, where am I going with this? Fruit trees, there we go, found a thing. Um, when you plant a fruit tree, a lot of people don't know that you very immediately have to prune your tree. So it depends on the kind of fruit tree. Uh, most of the fruit trees that Tree Folks gives out are things like peaches, plums. These are stone fruit. So stone fruit have a very specific way they need to be pruned and people don't like doing it. That's because when you get a stone fruit, you have to cut most of the tree off. So stone fruit need to be grown in what's called an open goblet shape, which I'm going to draw it now like this, which is not the normal way that a tree is going to grow. So what happens is when you get your tree in a pot, it looks like this. What you want to do, probably have another color marker, is make the cut there. 
And what that's going to do is it's going to take all of the center trunk out of the tree and it's going to make it start growing in what's called an open goblet. And that prevents a lot of fungal diseases for our stone fruits, uh, especially diseases on the bark because the bark gets a lot more airflow and the bark gets a lot more sunlight hitting it. So that's why open goblet's really important for those trees. Uh, for other fruit trees like apples and pears, uh, loquats, for, you, 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 I think you do, yeah, you do this for loquats and persimmons, uh, it's called apical dominance. And for that one, it's actually really easy. Uh, it's as easy as you leave the lowest branches the longest and the top branches the shortest. Can you say that one more time? So you want the lowest branches the longest and the top branches the shortest. So here's your really happy dog. And so now I'm going to show you where the proper cut from. Like that. So uh, you can even be more aggressive than this. It's hard to hear you, Colin. Uh, is it better if I get a little closer? I think so. I think it's when you um, hold it up. That makes sense. Okay. So that's the cuts that you should make. And what is it called, Colin? This is called apical dominance. Apical. And so the apex of the tree is the top. Apex. And the apex of the tree produces a lot of really important plant hormones. And so you wanna encourage those to be produced in an apple and a pear. You don't wanna encourage those to be produced in a plum or a peach. And what about a fig? A fig is a little different because you can just like kind of do whatever you want to a fig and it'll still give you figs. So the fig <laughs> is actually the only one that we ever recommend topping. So that's the one tree that you can top. And the reason you top a fig is because it gets too tall. So you grow a fig to harvest figs. You don't want to have to harvest figs that are well over your head. So you want to cut the tree at breast height, which is right here. So just right, right at your sternum and your sternum. Don't worry about anybody else's sternum because you want it to be easy for you. So cut it off and then take what you cut off and put that in wet dirt. And that's a new fig tree. You got a Christmas present for someone you don't really like that much and don't want to spend money on. It's perfect. <laughs> what about a pomegranate? Uh, pomegranates are generally, you don't really need to do a lot of pruning on a pomegranate. Uh, it's one of the few trees that you actually do summer pruning on because you want to take what's called the bull shoots out of the center of the tree. Bull shoots are going to be shoots coming off of the branches that grow straight up. And they're called bull shoots because they form really quickly and they grow really fast and they get really big. Um, if you ever see bull in front of something and a plant, that means it grows fast and big. So uh, loblollies are known as bull pines for that very reason. Oh. So the, the bull shoots need to be cut out and then that should really help with fruit production and the size of the fruit that you're getting. If you don't do that, you're gonna get smaller fruit and fewer fruit. Um, if you want to uh, kind of encourage a healthy shape, uh, that's when you wanna do your winter pruning for a pomegranate. And it's mostly just pruning out anything dead, diseased, or rubbing against each other. Uh, I'm pretty sure pomegranates bloom on new wood, so you can almost hack it back with impunity. What if there's uh, I'm thinking about it in my community garden. There's these. There's an orchard with uh, mainly the um, stone fruits that are um, just, I think they've just been untended and unpruned for so long. So is it too late? No, it's actually never too late. Um, so stone fruit don't live very long to begin with. So you're never really going to shorten its life very much by pruning it over. Um, it might be too late in that you will have poor production for one or two years, but you can really rejuvenate the tree by doing some drastic pruning that will encourage better production in the future. It can take up to three years to see that better production, especially if you've been kind of lax on pruning, but mm -hmm. it does come. Mm -hmm. So when is the best time to do that? Uh, best time to do pruning is actually December through January. So you want everything to be completely dormant mm -hmm. and you don't want it to start flowing sap yet. Mm -hmm. 
And now plums and peaches, I believe, bloom on second year wood. So that's what you have to be trying to encourage is a prevalence of second year wood. So obviously that can be difficult if you're trying to like really reduce a tree. Uh -huh. That's why it's going to take a few years to get there. Okay. For the apples and pears though, they actually produce uh, what's called a uh, fruiting spur, which is a special floral structure that's going to come off of the twig. Uh, you just, you don't want to remove those. That's the important part because those remain on the tree and that's where it's going to bloom from and that's where it's going to produce its fruit. So are loquat and Asian persimmons apical dominant? Is yes. that right? Okay. Uh, that is correct. However, you are fighting the nature of the plant. So uh, loquats want to grow in what is called a decurrent structure, meaning it does not have apical dominance. So uh, decurrent means it's got really long branches that kind of go any way it wants. Um, the reason you prune it into apical dominance is it gives it a little better structure and it makes it a little longer lived. For the uh, Asian persimmon though, they are, um, it's for the structure as well, but uh, they won't ever actually look apically dominant, even if you did a good job, because they just were gonna grow into a dome. That's how they grow. It's very difficult to do them, do anything else besides a dome. So Deb, have, you've planted trees before, right? In 2019, I got some Monterey oak from, a, a Monterey oak from you, um, like I said, that one died. And the other one that died was the evergreen sumac. No. Um, I know. I love those. <laughs> and this is the one weird one. This, I, Austin Energy gave me this one. The flame leaf sumac, just a month ago, all the leaves turned brown and the wood turned black. I, it must be a disease or something. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound good. Um, yeah. But you know, can it you has, send me it has, pictures? It has, well, it has suckers coming out, so it's not dead, dead. So, okay. but I bombed. It was, you know, like 15 feet tall, but the suckers. Oh, wow. were, so that's good. Okay, it sounds like you probably had cambium damage in the freeze. We're actually okay. seeing that kind of like across town. Uh, and what happens is the tissue between the canopy and the roots dies. So uh, the roots are still alive. That's why you're seeing the suckers. The canopy was still alive. That's why the leaves came out, but there was nothing to feed the canopy. Yep. So the leaves just die. Okay. Um, luckily, if it was 15 feet tall, you're going to have a 10 foot tree next year. So, yeah, yeah, those are awesome trees. I, mean, I don't know how often you guys get them, but Austin Image, you gave me one when they cut down all those hackberries. I, I fit to fit. I said, I need more trees. So they gave me the flame leaf sumac, and it's wonderful. I hope they're amazing. Them. I yeah. love them. <laughs> I actually have like a giant grocery bag over here of flame leaf sumac seeds that we're going to use for reforestation. But I did, I wanted to mention that um, a few things have changed recently in tree planting where now we're actually really want you to focus on making sure you find the root flare. Uh, so that's trying to get the top of the soil down to where you start to see the first roots come out of the trunk. And then to also make sure you do a lot of root work, which is to get like a rake or comb and go into that root ball and really try to comb those roots out a lot. Okay. We found that it really encourages uh, like uh, establishment. So you'll have to water it less sooner, which is always good. But like what, what you guys were talking about earlier, I'm also in, in Windsor Park area and it's very, it, I, the, pe the soil, I call it peanut butter fudge because that's what the soil <laughs> is like here. It's like peanut butter and fudge mixed together. It's horrible. So yeah, that was, that was good information. <laughs> Yeah, I'm up in the Northwest up here and like we have three inches of this sticky black clay and then a solid limestone. <laughs> so, yeah. I have a lot of raised beds. <laughs> Which by the way, that is a perfectly acceptable way to plant a tree. A raised bed is a great way to plant a tree if you have really bad soil. Um, you have to make sure it's a large raised bed. So uh, the tree has to have a critical root zone that can be like represented, representative of a large size class tree. Uh, critical root zones can be calculated easily though. So that's, oh no, I forgot how to calculate a critical root zone. Um, so basically <laughs> I think it's one foot for every inch diameter that your mature tree is expected to have. And so that's, that's how, wide your raised bed should be. 
Well, last weekend, my neighbor also got a pomegranate from you and she wants to put it in a big, like 50 gallon, one of those like, what, what do they call whiskey barrels? Will that mm -hmm. live in that? Like a yes, it will. Okay. Yes, it will. Um, so we don't, a lot of time, we don't recommend that you put your neighborhood's tree in a container because technically they're supposed to go in the ground, but a tree in a container is still going to increase the urban canopy, just not as much as it can in the ground. So it's still good. Um, we actually have a workshop available for purchase online called Growing Trees in Pots, which will go over all of the details for how to do that. But it's 55 gallons is great. That's a great size. You'll get pomegranates off of that tree. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because she, she she's older and she just wants to keep it close to her house in case we get a freeze again, you know. Oh. Um, it, word to the wise though, in a pot, trees tend to experience winter uh, 10 degrees colder yeah. than they do in the ground. Because they're not in the ground. Yeah, but at least that way she can she can drag it into her garage yeah. overnight or whatever. So, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, pomegranates are especially good for growing in pots. Uh, they are adapted to tight rooting conditions because they're from the Middle East and it's like a rocky desert. Right. Um, other things that grow in similar conditions include most smaller Texas natives and fig trees. Well, like I said, I did sign up for the Oak Hill at HEB, but if the Monterey Oaks aren't coming in, which it doesn't sound like they will, I might cancel yeah. that. So wait another season. That's fair. Yeah, get the tree you want. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's it's like adopting a cat or a dog. I mean, it's there for life. So I don't oh, yeah. know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Then, you know. Longer than a cat or a dog, hopefully. <laughs> Speaking of something that you wanted to live, you know, forever, but sometimes people don't have the house yet. Are there specific trees that are better to be left in a pot for the next few years, for few years, if someone's in an apartment, but is planning to move to a house, you know, so that they could keep it alive and then plant it? Are there certain varieties that are better? Like, I remember Tori had like a Myers lemon or something that she was yeah. keeping. Um, Meyer lemon is great. I really recommend you keep the Meyer lemon in a pot, though. So don't put it in the ground. It's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only citrus that you can really get away with in the ground here is trifoliate orange, and no one wants that. Uh, there are other more cold hardy citrus, uh, satsuma, uh, the, uh, the kumquats, uh, and then I had a Kara Kara orange survive Yuri in the ground, actually. So, yeah, those are pretty cold hardy. Um, so there are a few weird ones that you can get by with. I find Meyer lemons to be very temperamental, though, especially in Austin soil. Uh, they have a very difficult time getting enough nitrogen, uh, and I've had to resort to foliar sprays of like chemicals, of like fertilizer chemicals, to yeah. like, encourage them to do well. Yeah, that's the primary reason why we pretty much don't really give those out anymore because we found that most of them just end up dying. What about um, pawpaws and pineapple guava? How do they do uh, here? Pawpaw is great. Can't go in a pot. They have a really extensive taproot. Uh, you need to plant it in a wetter spot. So I actually know where your house is. It's great for pawpaws. You should plant pawpaws. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they grow slowly though. That is the only tree that I am going to recommend that you plant the largest one that you can find because, oh God, I grew, I'm growing pawpaws from seed and I will never see a pawpaw. <laughs> 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 Wow. Um, but then the pineapple guava, they do excellent in pots. Um, they do really, really well. And actually, those are really cool because the flowers are edible, too. Matt said, do you need to plant multiples or do they fruit on their own? They fruit on their own if the mockingbirds leave your flowers alone because oh. my mockingbird comes and eats all the flowers so I don't get any fruit. <laughs> we have a, plenty of hawks that live right there on the side that keep most of the birds away or eat the birds. And 
If you're trying to grow feijoa, don't forget that they're only ripe if they fall off the tree. So you have to look around the bottom of the tree for ripe feijoa. So watch for the squirrels. Maybe don't worry about the mockingbirds, but the squirrels. <laughs> well, the mockingbirds eat the flowers and then the squirrels eat the fruit. Yeah. But yeah, so feijoa is actually one of my favorite fruits for Central Texas. They're incredibly exotic for doing really well. Awesome. Oh, okay, what else, Matt? <laughs> how, do pears, how do pears do here, Colin? Pears do okay. Uh, you really want to stick to something like the kefir pear, something with low chill hours and high heat tolerance. Um, you also want to pay attention to fire blight, though. Fire blight is a major issue here in Central Texas, and this last year was a real doozy for fire blight. We had a lot pass through and a lot of pears are currently infected. So um, the best thing to do if you see fire blight on your pear is to prune a foot down from where you see fire blight, just cut it off, uh, and then with a very sterilized tool, and then sterilize your tool again, before and after every cut. So uh, fire blight is a bacteria. It is exceptionally infectious. Uh, you can walk by a tree carrying another tree with fire blight, and that gives that tree fire blight. It sucks. I did that in my yard last year. Um, the COVID of pears. What's that? It's the COVID of pears. Actually, it hits everything in the rose group. So it hits apples, it hits pears, it hits roses, it hits crab apples. Um, my Blanco crab apple actually got fire blight this year. Yes. And loquats. And low quads, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, pears, though, I am always squeamish around pears because of the Bradford pear. Uh, Bradford pears are an incredibly invasive tree. Uh, they are planted all over because they have amazing fall color and they grow really quickly. They also die very quickly, so it's a bit of a problem. Um, but they also produce uh, a berry, well, it's a pear. Uh, it's just very small and birds eat it and they poop it out in the woods. Um, so you end up with pears everywhere. I don't think that the edible pears have the same concerns associated with them, but I mean, pears make me squeamish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's and like then the, um, the next question is always apples. So. I'll just nip that one in the bud. Don't plant apples in Central Texas, it's a bad idea. It does not go well. Uh, we have too many cedar trees. There is a uh, infectious pathogen that uses cedar trees as an alternative host to apples called cedar apple rust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cedar apple rust. Um, and what happens is on the cedar, it turns into this like crazy orange jelly fingers that come out of the cedar when it rains and they're really- It looks crazy. so cool. They're, I mean, it's so bad, cool. but... It's... They smell nasty, though. They smell so bad, especially when, like, the entire cedar forest is doing it. Anyway, um, that produces spores. Those spores go in the rain, the water, and the wind. They hit the apple tree. They get into the apple tree leaves, and they form a rust. So it's uh, little spots all over the leaves that... Um, are kind of rust colored and maybe powdery. And then you can start to see some weird bulges that look like they have like roots coming out of them. That's not a good sign. Uh, cedar apple rust is very difficult to treat. I don't know of any effective treatments. Uh, pruning it can make it worse. Uh, so the best thing is to cut down all the cedars. That doesn't really seem to be an option here. So I don't recommend it. That being said, there are people that grow apples successfully in Central Texas. So like anything is possible, just watch out. <laughs> yeah, but those people probably provide like extra good care. I have a friend that does have apple trees. He even grew a saguaro cactus in his yard. A saguaro. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. It's like this big. <laughs> oh, wow. So his yeah. his was six feet tall, but it died in the freeze. <laughs> yeah, but they're the, very cold hardy, though. It's impressive. Yeah, the little, it's not a skeleton. What's it called? The internal sides of the cacti. I would have so called that, it a skeleton. Yeah, that's still there, though, in his yard. It's so cool. I mean, that's cool. That's great. 
which actually brings me to an important topic, habitat trees. So um, a lot of Austin's canopy is aging and that inherently makes it dangerous. So the first thing that we wanna do with aging trees is reduce the danger. So if reduce there are the targets, what? what's that? Reduce the what? The danger. So uh, if there are targets around, uh, if the tree is near a house, a walkway, a street, we wanna prune that tree down. We wanna keep that from hurting anyone, right? Uh, or causing any property damage. Unfortunately though, dead trees are a very important part of the ecosystem and actually an important habitat for a lot of very charismatic animals. Possums, raccoons, bluebirds, woodpeckers, all only live in cavities in dead wood. So to encourage these populations, I really like to suggest to people that they reduce their trees, their dead and dying trees, as much as they can while still leaving as much as they can. So you want to reduce any aspect of it that poses a threat, any hanging limbs, uh, anything like that. You don't ever really want the tree, what's left, to be taller than 12 feet because that could fall on someone. But it's important to leave these hanging snags, or sorry, not hanging snags, but standing snags in our forest because the dying and decaying wood creates cavities and cavities are where life lives. Just as an example, um, I had a, oh, let's see, I'll call that 30 feet tall. Uh, it's a ratama. Well, it was a ratama. It's currently dead. It died in Yuri. Um, this was a very, very large tree. It was about like 25 years old. Um, but uh, now that it's dead, it was dropping limbs on my truck in the driveway. So I actually went up there and cut all the limbs out uh, and so that we could leave the, the standing snag for the woodpeckers, which have been coming religiously all summer to eat the, uh, the beetles out of it. Uh, and actually, it was funny because while I was cutting the tree down, my neighbor, who this tree is like, part of it was hanging over her uh, yard, so I was making sure to get those so it wouldn't, it was very spiny. Um, but she was like, oh, can you not cut it all down? Can you please leave some of it? Because they have a family of screech owls that actually nest in their yard. And the papa comes out and likes to sit on my ratama and watch his babies as they forage in the yard. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's all you had to say. The tree stays up. That's awesome. Oh, you're muted, Margo. Well, I'm just showing the, the hillside with the Texas sunset, talking about the trees of Austin route by Jester King getting ready for a beer festival. That's awesome. <laughs> Just sharing the trees. Since everybody has a look at their computers. Aww. I know. Are there certain trees that large owls and hawks, um, you know, gravitate towards? Like we wanted more hawks in our hood, like hmm. more of these trees, sort of thing. Uh, hawks really rely a lot on perches. Uh, mm. They like to hunt from a perch often. Uh, so I would look for trees that have. Um, a wide open structure uh, and more perpendicular than acute branch angles. So uh, you don't want your branch to come off of the tree like this, you want it to come off the tree like that. Uh, the immediate thought that I have is walnuts. Walnuts have a very coarse angular branching structure that tends to leave them very open. Uh, and that can be great for uh, big birds of prey. Uh, oaks are really good for that too. Uh, and especially uh, oaks are great because they also encourage small mammals to come by, which hawks always love. And you can also encourage hawks by encouraging uh, lower trophic levels. So uh, small birds, small mammals, and small lizards are all great things to encourage. Oh, right, and if you want to encourage small birds, uh, one of the smallest and most engaging birds we have in Central Texas is going to be the lesser goldfinch. They are attracted to the color yellow. So uh, I suggest planting a ratama. They bloom yellow also. Very interesting that your ratama didn't come back. I've seen- I did from the roots. So okay. um, yeah, I do have like five sprouts that are now about six or seven feet tall, but- nice. Yeah, I saw uh, there are a bunch of Ratama or Palo Verde in, uh, at Roy Guerrero Park. And I was pretty bummed out because I thought, my gosh, 
you know, they've died and it seemed like they were just weren't coming back. But then I think in like late September, they all started just shooting out growth, even from the, you know, limbs and oh, not awesome. even from the ground, but they ended up making it. They just needed some extra time, I guess. Yeah, I mean, for mine, the ice melted and then all the bark fell off. So I was just like, oh, oh yikes. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it's going to be one of those situations like, what did you call it earlier? Cambium dive cambium, or, Yeah, cambium, cambium death. damage. Um, it's this or Tama. It was funny. I thought it had died completely, but since the bark had popped off, what had happened was there was a tube of bark around the trunk and all the shoots were growing up inside the tube of bark. So like I started knocking bark off and there were green foliage fell out. <laughs> what? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I what think about... the weirdest oh, thing ahead. for me wow. in Yuri was the Mexican plum, no, sorry, Mexican olive that lived in my backyard. It survived. It didn't even die back to the roots. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what were you saying? That's wild. Um, hmm. I wonder if it's just, like I'm sure, is your backyard pretty planted pretty densely? Not over there. <clears throat> it was up against a fence, but I mean, hmm. a wooden fence. <laughs> What about if um, I have a tree and, you know, it looks like there's some of that cambium dieback. At what point does someone remove a tree? Um, and because I've seen this, um, as I was delivering neighborhood trees last year, I saw it a lot uh, with some of those trees that builders will go ahead and just plant when they build the house. So uh, like, at what point should someone take action, especially while the maybe while those trees are smaller. Yeah, that's very difficult to answer. Uh, at one point, do I take action on my tree is one yeah. of those idiosyncratic questions that like, I need a picture of the tree. Um, yeah. The short answer to that is, um, I mean, pretty much wait till it's dead. Or if it's large, if this is a big tree and like there's branches that are hanging over your house, branches hanging over your car, the street, call an arborist. That's, that's something that might need to be addressed quickly. Um, especially since they've been standing for almost a year now, things that uh, might have died in Yuri probably will start coming down soonish. Uh, it can take years for trees to come down after they die, but uh, some of the weaker wooded ones can start to come down faster. Um, but if it's a small tree, uh, mm -hmm. If it's something like 15 gallons, 20 gallons, maybe it's a five gallon that you planted five years ago, it's gotten a little large, but now it's dying and like you're really sure it's dying and it's smaller, take it out, plant a new tree. Just if it's showing a loss of vigor, it's never going to be the vigorous tree that you need to create cancer. So if it's, if it's dying and like kind of senescing, it's on its way out and it's small, then just replace it already. I mean, maybe if you're kind of attached to that tree, leave it in the ground, it might come back and plant another one next to it just in case. So uh, I was actually talking to my aunt on the phone the other day and she was so proud of herself. She just planted four loquats and she was like, yeah, they planted all these cherry trees and they're not doing well. He's in Louisiana, so not here. <laughs> um, but. Uh, she was really excited because she had planted all the loquats underneath the cherry trees so that once the cherries die, she'll still have trees there. I was like, Candace, that's exactly what we tell people to do. That's perfect. And so, yeah, that is what you need to be doing. Uh, if you have an aging or dying tree, it's always a good idea to plant a tree underneath it uh, so that it can replace that tree when it dies. Remember, though, it might get trampled by the arborists. So maybe plant more than one. <laughs> Well, if no one has any more questions, Deb, what's your favorite tree? Um, I don't know. I mean, I really, really do love the live oaks, but I don't have the room for them in my yard. And actually, I was going to ask you that. So I'm, like I said, I'm near Windsor Park. And mm -hmm. when you drive down 51st from like Berkman, HEB to, to the Highway 35, they yep. put live oaks along 51st, but they're really close together. Don't these trees grow to be like a hundred feet tall? I mean, 
do they have to prune them every six months or something? Um, actually, live oaks, I know, so don't quote me on this because technically in neighborhoods, you shouldn't plant trees that close together and this is a neighborhoods event, but live oaks are one of the few trees that you can actually get away with close planting. Um, for starters, trees fully expect to germinate next to a tree about this far away. Okay. So that's what they're planning for. Uh, they go through all these stages. There's uh, germination, then they go through stem exclusion, which is when they start competing with their neighbors and they'll shade out the ones that can't compete. So that's how we get our forests. But we try not to do that in urban environments because you know you lose trees. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we try to plant them farther apart. Those trees though, I mean, yes, they are really close together. Um, it's less of a competition issue, uh, especially for below ground. Because live oaks, when their roots touch, they graft them together and they functionally become one tree. So it's a large root mass with a lot of stems coming out of it. Now those stems might compete for light a little bit, but ultimately what they're gonna do is grow up more than out. Okay, cause I mean like my neighbor, like I, like I said, I'm in Windsor Park and it's a 50 year old neighborhood and the live oaks across the street from me are ginormous. I mean, they're 50, 60 years old. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. like, how are they gonna live on 51st street like that? But I understand what you're saying. You know, they'll just, it's like a forest. They'll just grow like a forest. Yeah, and we generally don't plant like that in cities. So that's why it's surprising. Cause like the reason we don't plant like that is cause it costs so much for what ends up being a normal uh, density forest at the end. They normally would plant them farther apart so that they don't have to deal with the attrition down there. Oh, that's what I thought. Well, whatever. I don't know who planned that area, so. <laughs> But well, so at um, Tree Folks, we do reforestation services and we do that really close planting all along yeah. creeks and stuff. It's actually funny because in Houston, they do the same services, but they use five gallon trees like we plant in neighborhoods here because oh, they get wow. so much rain, you can just do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it rains tonight. I can't wait. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but a quick question about the Monterey oak that you gave me, and it did die in the freeze. So picture the trunk. And that died, so I cut it. It's like six inches off the ground. Now there was two, I don't know what you call them, uh, water spouts? Yeah, I don't suckers. Know, suckers, whatever. There's two shooting up from the trunk. Are those gonna live? I mean, cause there's the trunk that's dead and then there's two shooters. How is that gonna become a tree? It will become a tree, I promise. <laughs> it takes a little effort on your part though. Okay, so uh, what happens, Actually, so uh, cool thing, this is a bonsai technique. <laughs> it's called trunk chopping. Uh, this is how all bonsai trees get made. They, they take a whole tree, they cut it all the way down like a few inches from the base and they take one of those shoots and that's the new leader. Okay. And so what you do is you train that shoot upward and you, you have it grow and prune it so that it grows like a normal tree. And that wound, that cut that you made on the old trunk will eventually heal over. Uh, so that'll callus, and you'll have a callus constricting over it like that, and eventually you won't see any wood. Uh, that new trunk will take over as the full trunk of the tree, and eventually you really won't see the even the problem at the bottom. Okay, so I have two suckers coming out. Should I just cut it to one? No. <laughs> Good okay. question, though. Uh, everyone wants to cut it to one. Actually, right now, it needs all the photosynthetic tissue it can get. So okay. you actually don't want to cut it down to one until maybe next year, maybe the year after. Okay, I can wait, yeah. Okay. So uh, if, you're, if the stem gets larger than your thumb, that's when it's time to cut it. Okay. Because yeah. okay. that limits the amount of wounding that you're going to do to the tree. Yep. Okay. And remember, if you're cutting on an oak tree, you need to paint your cuts. Yeah, I do have the paint. Okay, yeah. good. Great, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you for all this information. This is great. Oh, yeah. Happy to help. Yeah. Also happy to hear that tree's coming back on the roots. That's great. I know. I mean, I, like I said, I love my neighbor has a Monterey Oak that's probably 20 years old and they mm -hmm. don't drop their leaves 100%. That's why I really want one because I hate yeah. leaking. I know you can mulch, but you know what I mean? It's like yeah. leaf litter or whatever. <laughs> Oh yeah. So, <laughs> the less leaf litter I have, because every everything around me, we have cedar elms next door that are 70 feet tall. I have enough leaf litter to deal with. So the less mm -hmm. I have, the better. So it's good. Oh yeah, that is fair. <laughs> I'm one of those people that goes around and steals leaf bags out yeah. of like everyone's driveway. So yeah. 
can I have that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really don't mind people raking up there. It's great for me. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna jump, but thank you so much for this information. Um, thank you so much for coming. And like I said, you saw my email about the Buckeye Seeds. If you can't make it, tell me and we'll figure out if I can get to your office next week, you know, so yep. it's totally fine. So cool. I have a studio, thank you. <laughs> They're on my porch, so that you said it's awesome. on the way to work, so whenever. Yeah, and you're, yeah, it's definitely on the way to work. It's super close. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, you guys, take care. Yeah, thanks so much for coming, appreciate it. Bye. Take care.